Okay, so I just want to introduce my uh, one of my closest friends, Michael Fryer. Hi, Michael. Hi, Richard. So I've known Michael for, I would say, almost 13 years. We met at university uh, when we were both studying theology. I was studying theology because I was going into ministry. Michael was studying it for, for fun. And that's the guy that he is. So we've known each other for a long time. Michael is one of my closest friends. And I've um, tried to get him to speak at Lucan uh, previous times, but it hasn't worked out. And through modern technology, and uh, Michael's willingness, he is with us today to, to speak to us. Uh, so it's really, really uh, good to have you along, Michael. Uh, Michael, we're down here in Lucan. Where are you at the moment? So I'm in Newton Abbey, which is just to the north of Belfast, uh, suburb of Belfast um, in uh, County Antrim. I work as an outreach officer for a Second World War Museum in Belfast. Um, so my work is largely going out to community groups, working with uh, particularly groups of older people, care home residents. I do a lot of reminiscence work uh, because that age group, um, many of them still remember the war. Uh, I do a lot of work as well with people living with dementia and I would do talks and tours and all kinds of other things. Um, like so many of us during this past year, uh, I've had to work a lot from home because the museum has been closed. So I've been doing a lot of work over Zoom. Zoom has become my, I'm not sure it's my good friend over these past few months, but um, it's certainly helped me to keep contact with a lot of these groups and particularly with um, people in, in care homes that I wouldn't be able to go into at the minute. Okay. Um, thanks, Michael. Uh, so when you're not, uh, when you're not working um, in the museum, um, what else do you get up to? What do you fill your time with, particularly during these lockdown months? Uh, I love watching movies. Uh, big, big film fan. I miss going to the cinema. So whenever things return to some kind of normality, I look forward to, to going back on regular cinema trips. Uh, I really enjoy reading. Um, I read a lot of biographies, novels, nonfiction, that kind of thing. Uh, I like walking. Uh, I, I'm trying to keep up running. I did Couch to 5K <laughs> during lockdown, which was quite an achievement for me. Um, and trying desperately to stay fit as the years pass by. It's hard to know why we're friends, Michael, whenever you're into reading biographies and history books and stuff. But um, uh, that's great. Uh, we're, we're doing a series, as you know, in, in LPC at the moment, Stigmas in the Church. Um, and you've agreed to come and speak to one of those today. Why, why do you think uh, a series of sermons on stigmas in the church is important? And why is that something that churches need to hear about? Well, I think um, one of the issues that we sometimes have um, regarding particularly topics that might have some kind of stigma attached to them, is that it's very easy to think about issues, to have an opinion on them, um, maybe even to have a theological opinion about them without actually thinking about lived experience. You know, what is it actually like for people who have to live with these kinds of issues every day of their lives? Um, and I think that's where stigma comes in because it's very easy to talk about them. Um, so for example, if we're thinking about the issue of sexuality as we are today. Um, I'm just conscious that sometimes we think that it's an issue that people don't face in the church, you know. Um, I've heard people before say that I don't have, or, or there aren't people like that in my church. Um, where, whereas the fact is that probably if you started to really think about it, or if people felt that they could be more honest and open about what they're experiencing in their lives, you would find that that's actually not the case. Um, and, you know, as Christians, if we're called to love our neighbors ourselves, I think a really good starting point is to start thinking about, well, actually, what is my neighbor's experience? What is my neighbor's story? And rather than just, um, talking about issues, maybe we should start talking to the people who actually have to face these issues. Um, so so I just really commend you and LPC for wanting to spend some time thinking about particular issues that have stigma attached to them in the church, because I think it's actually the mark of a really um, healthy church. And I think it's just something that's so important uh, because we never know what um, 
you know, uh, people in our churches are, 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 are actually facing in their, in their everyday lives. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate that. And, and again, I appreciate you taking the time out to do this for us today. Um, there are many Bible passages that, you know, highlight people being on the outside with um, issues that are stigmatized or issues of shame. Um, but you've um, highlighted one for us this morning. Um, do you want to just tell us which passage you're focusing on this morning and, and why you uh, rested on this one? Yeah, so um, I chose a passage from Mark's Gospel uh, in Mark chapter 5, although it is recorded in other Gospels as well. It's the story of Jesus' encounter um, with a woman um, who had a, a hemorrhage. She, she, she had a problem with bleeding. Um, and I, I love the story because um, I find the woman's story so compelling. Um, you know, this was a woman who had lived for 12 years with this particular condition. Um, we're told in the passage that she'd spent all her money on doctors, on, on trying to get medical help, and actually she'd ended up um, in a worse situation. And uh, I just think there's something about this woman that's so compelling, her story. I think there's something, uh, hopefully in all of us, if we are at all compassionate, empathetic people, that we can identify maybe with the the, the kind of stigma that this woman felt in her life, the shame that she felt, and yet she found the courage to be able to to step into a crowd of people and um, to touch Jesus because she believed that would bring her healing as it did. And then Jesus' response to her, which was so compassionate um, and so uh, just, you know, so, so character, uh, so just such a characteristic, so characteristic of him. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a great, it's a great story. Michael, um, thanks. Could you read that passage for us? Um, just to finish up this little time and then uh, we'll, we'll hear God's word and then listen to your message. Thank you. Yeah. So this is Mark chapter five, verses 24 to 34. A large crowd followed and pressed round Jesus. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned round in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Amen. Amen. I am a gay man and I am a Christian. To be honest, there have been times in my life when I have probably wanted to be able to say that I am only one of those things, but it's the truth. My uh, sexual orientation means that I am attracted to people of the same sex, and my faith means that I am a follower of Jesus. And for a large part of my life now, I have been trying as best I can to hold those two sometimes seemingly incompatible parts of my identity together. As some of you may already be aware, to wrestle so personally with issues of sexuality and faith can be an immensely painful experience. But for me, it's also been an experience in which I hope I can say that God has blessed me and he's made me the person that I am today. One of my favorite quotes about Sexuality is uh, from the author Alan Bennett, 
who famously was very coy about his sexual orientation for a long time. And supposedly the actor Sir Ian McKellen once asked him if he was gay or not, to which Alan Bennett replied, asking uh, me whether I'm gay or not is like asking a man who's crawling across the Sahara Desert whether he'd prefer Evian or Perrier water. Well, even before I started crawling across the Sahara, I knew that I preferred Evian water and nothing was going to make me drink Perrier. Looking back, I must have been around 12 or 13 when I first realised that I was gay. Um, And when the full realisation dawned on me in my early teens, I think it's probably fair to say that I was completely devastated. It was something that filled me with immense shame. While my peers at school were beginning to enjoy uh, discovering the opposite sex, I felt confused and frightened about what was happening to me. And worst of all, I couldn't tell anyone about what was happening, uh, what was going on inside my head. In the late 1990s grammar school in Belfast, to be gay was in many ways uh, the ultimate taboo. I still vividly remember one morning um, after a PE class in the changing rooms and the PE teacher who was an evangelical Christian was reading out the announcements uh, in the school for that day. And one of the announcements related to the school debating society with which I was involved and the motion for the debate that day was something like This house believes that homosexuality is unnatural. And without missing a beat, the teacher just said after he read this, it most certainly is, and then carried on reading the announcements. And even though that was over 20 years ago now, I can still remember how hurt I felt. And certainly it was not something that helped my frame of mind at the time. So needless to say, I didn't particularly enjoy my time at school. And by the time I went off to study at university in Scotland, my mental health really wasn't in a good place. I still hadn't told anyone about my sexuality. And even though this marked a new chapter in my life, I wasn't going to start talking about it now. I was on antidepressants for a lot of that time. And if I'm honest, there were points when I seriously thought my life would be better over. A pretty awful place for anyone to be, never mind a 21-year-old, with their whole life ahead of them. Things did change, though, in my third year at university because I I was in a halls of residence and I happened to meet a lot of um, new friends. And many of these new friends were Christians um, from back home. And I suppose up to that point, I'd never really met Christians before and certainly I didn't have a particularly positive view of God. Even though I'd been brought up going to church as a child and I would say I did have a belief in God, I think I I blamed him for making me gay. And so for me, God was somebody who was cold and uncaring, um, somebody who had played this terrible joke on me and had allowed me to suffer. But because my Christian friends were so accepting and caring, because when I finally uh, came out to them, they, they just accepted me for who I was. That, that made such a huge impression on me. They didn't judge me and it made a huge impact on, on my life. And so to cut a long story short, after much wrestling and prayer and talking with my friends who were just so supportive and encouraging, I became a Christian on Wednesday, the 7th of December, 2005. And as so often happens, particularly, I suppose, in the early stages of a a, a Christian's faith, I I was on fire for God. Um, After I came back home from from Scotland, uh, I started going to a local Presbyterian church and I I really threw myself into the life of that fellowship. I also made the decision to study for a master's in divinity at Union College in Belfast for a couple of years because I was so eager to learn about God and the Bible and all of the things that I felt were so important to understanding about my newfound Christian faith. And while I enjoy all of that, and I I think I I genuinely felt like God was leading me through those experiences. Looking back, I I do wonder if I was overcompensating uh, for the fact that I'd still really not come to terms with my sexuality. Because even though my mental health had hugely improved since I'd become a Christian, 
Um, I found that the older I got, um, the more my friends started to pair off and, and get married and have families, the more difficult it became to see myself living for the rest of my life as a celibate, still largely closeted gay man. I was immensely lonely and I would continue to be very lonely for many years to come. Although my family and my friends from my time in Scotland knew that I was gay, um, after I, I came home, um, I started to make a whole new group of friends through my involvement in church. And the vast majority of them had no idea about my sexuality. And so if I was ever asked about relationships with girls, I would just change the subject. If the topic of sexuality came up in church or in Christian circles, I, I would stay quiet. In fact, in some ways, I was probably reliving my school years all over again, refusing to acknowledge the truth about my sexuality and hoping somehow that if I buried it deep enough, then it would just go away. Having made the decision to live a celibate life then, even though it was a struggle and even though um, it brought me much pain and much loneliness, um, I, I, I was also... Um, being involved in church and getting a lot of encouragement um, in terms of uh, being recognised as having certain um, gifts for Christian leadership. And so being encouraged um, to recognise those gifts, I decided to apply for ministry in the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. And in 2011, having come through the application process, I was accepted um, to, to start um, my, my study for ministry. I should probably add that I didn't disclose my sexual orientation on the application form or during the application process. Um, there were no questions about it on the form. And to be honest, it was something I felt at the time was nobody else's business. I enjoyed my two years of training um, and study back at college. And in September 2012, I was assigned as an assistant minister to a large and vibrant uh, congregation in South uh, County Antrim, where I served for nearly four and a half years. Uh, I've no regrets at all about my time in ministry. It was an immense privilege to be involved in the life of that fellowship. And during my time there, I saw God at work in so many ways. And it also gave me the opportunity to make lifelong friends. And I'm very grateful for that experience. A lot has changed for me, though, in the past eight years, not least the fact that I have since left full-time ministry. It was an immensely difficult decision to make, but it's not something I have to say that I regret. Um, you may not be surprised to hear that my theology has also changed during that time, and but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. I hope that by sharing some of my story, you will understand that I have some awareness of the kind of stigma that those of us who are gay sometimes have to face in the church. It never fails to amaze me, for example, how many people I've come across who are in so many ways the most wonderful examples of Christian faith and what a Christian should be. And yet because they assumed that I was heterosexual, they felt they could say the most appallingly homophobic things in front of me. And suddenly, I, when, when people say that, I, I feel like that frightened, lonely 14-year-old back in the school changing rooms all over again. That's what it feels like. And it's so, so sad. I say that, by the way, as someone uh, who has Christian friends with whom I disagree about these issues theologically, but who are people whom I would never dream of uh, labelling as homophobic. What I do take issue with, though, is when I'm made to feel like I'm a theological problem to be solved. That, I feel, has been something that has been uh, too often the experience of LGBT people in the church. And to be honest, they deserve better. After all, that was the experience of the bleeding woman in Mark 9, wasn't it? The shame that she must have felt over something that was not her fault. Well, that was entirely a result of a particular religious worldview, one in which people like her were, were labelled as unclean. She was a theological problem for so many people, for the ruling authorities of the day. She read that she had spent 
Uh, we read that we, she had spent 12 years desperately trying to find a cure for her condition, only to find herself getting worse. How many tears must she have shed and how much loneliness must she have suffered? Maybe there were even times when she wondered if God was somehow punishing her. And yet somewhere within her, this outcast woman finds the courage to step into a crowd of people and demonstrate the most amazing faith. The kind of faith that believes that healing will come just by touching the Lord's cloak. You know, one of the great privileges for me in recent years has been to see the courage and faith of LGBT Christians whom I've got to know through various contacts. Many of them have stories that are deeply moving. Stories of suffering and shame. Stories of being made homeless or losing their jobs. Stories of being even outcast from their families, from their friends, and yes, sometimes even their churches because of who they are. And yet despite the rejection and the ridicule that they faced in their lives, they still follow Jesus. The poet William Butler Yeats once wrote, Think that where man's glory most begins and ends, and say my glory was I had such friends. I'm proud today to call many of these same LGBT people of faith my friends. They are an inspiration to me. I think it's appropriate then that I finish with the words of the Master himself. When Jesus looks down at this woman who's now kneeling at his feet, she's trembling with fear. Um, she starts to explain to Jesus what's happened when he asks um, who, who, who touched him. And Jesus acknowledges that it's her faith that's healed her. But note the word that Jesus calls her. He calls her daughter. He says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. You know, this is the only time in the Gospels where Jesus addresses a woman in this way. And daughter, of course, is a term of relationship. It's an acknowledgement by Jesus that this woman is not a stranger to him any longer. She is part of his family. You know, there are gay people in our churches who are our sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters, our grandchildren, our friends. They are young and old. Some of them are single and some are not. Some, are, some of them are leaders in their organisations. And yes, some are even leaders in our churches, just as I was. They may not have the same sexual orientation as you, but they have just as much a relationship with Jesus and they're, they're just as much a part of his family. And if anything comes from this series on stigmas in the church that you have been looking at in these past couple of weeks in LPC, then my prayer is that it will encourage you to become a more open, a more honest, and above all, a more compassionate church when it comes to how you relate to your fellow believers not least in terms of sexuality. Because I believe it's when we challenge prejudice, when we recognise fellowship, and when we acknowledge that we all need a saviour, that we truly become the church, the family of God that Jesus is calling us to be. I hope what I've shared with you has been an encouragement to you this morning. Thank you so much um, for listening to me. And may God bless you all.